Um, well, look, good morning and thanks for being here, first of all. Um, it's always a great pleasure to talk to people who are passionate about agriculture. I really enjoy that. And it's also a great pleasure to be able to actually do something for Fincia because um, I've been a, a fellow of Fincia for quite some time. Um, I think I, I did my diploma, my SIA diploma, back in the late 80s and um, it probably taught me everything I know about futures and foreign exchange options, derivatives, which has actually turned out to be pretty relevant because as you've heard I've spent quite a bit of time in banking and finance and now of course uh, in grain trading. So um, I've certainly gained a lot from my involvement with Fincia and it's nice to be able to have the occasional opportunity to give something back. Um, today what I'm going to do is focus on the enormous opportunity beckoning Australian farmers as global demand for food increases and we move from a mining boom to a dining boom. I'll focus my comments primarily on the grain industry because that's the industry that um, we know and understand best. And as well as talking about the opportunity and what we need to do here in Australia to realise it, I'll also focus on the funding side of the challenge, um, including the need for foreign investment that arise from the opportunity that's in front of us. And I'll concentrate on those opportunities, particularly as they relate to our supply chain, which is a really important part of agriculture, which quite often we don't really think about enough. So let me uh, turn first to the opportunity that I think we understand pretty well. This chart tells the story of the exponential population growth that we'll see through to 2050 and the resulting growth in global <coughs> traded grain. And I'm focusing particularly on wheat, barley and canola here because they're the grains that we grow best in Australia. So really we're on the doorstep of a global food revolution. It's a fundamental shift that's happening as the population of the world climbs by around 2.7 billion from where we are now to you know, somewhere approaching 10 billion over the next four decades. And if you think about it, 2.7 billion over 40 years is about 67 or 68 million people per year that the world's adding. That's about the population of France every year that we're adding and we need to feed. For Australian agriculture, the good news is that most of these new Frances that we're creating every year are in regions like Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, and these are regions that, compared with our competitors, including the US and Canada, we have a cheaper ocean freight to because of where we're located, so we're in the right place at the right time. And as Jeremy was saying, most of these regions are expected to demand more protein in their diet, and that's going to accelerate the demand for grain because yeah, depending on what kind of protein you're producing, you can need, say, around four tonnes of grain to produce one tonne of meat or egg, eggs or dairy. And of course, these regions can't be self-sufficient. Their, their climatic conditions are not suitable for growing at the kind of grain that they want to consume. Um, and uh, they will increasingly rely on imported grain from countries like Australia. So what does this actually mean for Grain Corp? Our business at Grain Corp has been built around the network on the left there that you can see of our storage and port assets that span Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. So you can see there's a lot of detail there. All of those little names are um, some fantastic names actually. If you really want to get to know Country Australia um, you can uh, get to know our sites. There's around about 300 country receivable sites serving about 10,000 grain growers and they also of course serve domestic customers of grain of which there are many on the East Coast and international customers. So that's the origins of Grain Corp and you can see those little sites flow down to our seven bulk ports right around the East Coast of Australia. Over the years though, and particularly over recent years, we've been able to build on that starting asset base to become an international leader in connecting the high quality grain that we grow 
in the east coast on the east coast of Australia with the food and ingredient processes down the line. Hi Angus. Our marketing business is the largest exporter of grain from Eastern Australia, trading now to 25 different countries. So we were able to get into marketing following particularly the removal of the single wheat desk in 2008 and that business has really grown very successfully for us. And now we've also got three downstream processing businesses ourselves, so Allied Mills, which is Australia's largest flour miller, Grain Corp Malt, which is one of the largest maltsters in the world, serving the large brewers and distilleries in Australia, Asia, Europe and in North America. And then Grain Corp Oils, based on two acquisitions we made last year, which is the largest integrated edible oil crushing and refining business in Australia and New Zealand. Now, this is a picture of our, our, the export supply chain, which as I said, is often something that we don't really think about, but is incredibly important. Because those assets that I described and the farmers that we work with are ideally positioned to capture the demand growth that I referred to earlier. However, being able to participate in that coming boom is going to require quite a lot of investment in our supply chain to ensure that it's up to international standard. And it's really important that that investment is targeted in the areas where it's most needed. So if you look at all the costs of moving through grain through the supply chain, which we've depicted up here on this slide, um, just getting it to port can add $75 or $100 to a tonne of grain. And when you consider that the cost of grain at our port to the international customer could be, say, $300, you can see that that 75 to 100 is a pretty meaningful chunk of the cost of getting grain to a customer. As I mentioned before, we're lucky that we've got this freight advantage over our competitors to many of the destinations where demand's expected to grow. And, and that advantage is worth, say, 5 to $15 a tonne. That's, what it's, that's the order of it. So $5 to $15 a tonne in the highly competitive world of grain trading can make the difference between winning or losing a customer's business. And for a grower, it can make the difference between an ordinary year and a good year. Um, or for those growers who have a choice, between the decision to grow grain or grow, run cattle. So to maximise potential returns to the grower and to make sure that Australian grain is competitive in international markets, we have to make every effort to keep these supply chain costs as low as possible and maintain that cost advantage that we have. So one of the uh, contributors to the efficiency of our supply chain is its capacity. A helpful way to think about the supply chain is like a pipe through which grain flows from the farm through the system and then out of the country uh, through our ports. And the pipe in Eastern Australia looks something like this. There's plenty of capacity there on the left hand side to comfortably handle demand and down the right hand side, except in the middle where there's a substantial and growing bottleneck. So on the left hand side, in in upcountry storage, there's a huge surplus of capacity. The average Australian crop, Eastern Australian crop, over the last 10 years is around about 16 or 17 million tonnes. Our network alone has 20 million tonnes of storage and there's an additional 20 million on top of that provided by other companies and on-farm storage. So in other words, we've got enough capacity in the country to carry the average crop two and a half times over. At the other end of the pipe is our ports. And our ports have an elevation capacity of something like 15 million tonnes of grain every year we could put through them. That's three times our average export task, which is only around, only around five to five and a half million tonnes. So there's plenty of capacity available at ports for exporters who wish to export grain. From an investment point of view, it's, it's difficult to see that additional investment to build more ports or to put in more country storage is likely to be attractive or a good use of capital. And as the slide shows, the bottleneck between country and ports is our rail network. And this is an unfortunate situation because rail 
is crucial to the efficiency and competitiveness of our landside supply chain, which has to cope obviously with some pretty large distances and also the challenge of getting grain across the Great Dividing Range. So just to bring that to life for you, the average train can carry 2,000 tonnes of grain, while the average truck hauls about 40 or 45 tonnes, that's all. So if we're loading an average export vessel at port, we need 18 tra trains to load it, or 900 truck trips, a massive difference in efficiency. So this is a bit of a complicated chart, but to sort of look at the, uh, the lines and, um, and the green area, particularly the green line and the, um, the, uh, the green section of the bar, and it shows that the proportion of grain arriving at our ports has been steadily increasing, let's say from around 15%, which is what it used to be, to um, something approaching a third. And why is this occurring? Well, certainly uh, one of the problems and a substantial problem has been systematic underinvestment by state governments um, of all complexions over many decades in country branch lines. In many cases, these lines have been in slow decline over many years or never been repaired after flooding or a natural disaster occurs. And as a result, many of them operate with significant speed restrictions. Some the train can only go to a maximum speed of 20 kilometres an hour, for example. Um, and also many of them operate with substantial weight restrictions because they can't safely carry heavy loads anymore. Our rail productivity substantially lags that of Canada, which is one of our major competitive threats to service these key markets. So the Canadian grain industry runs at an in industry average of about 100 tonnes per rail wagon and regularly runs trains that are 100 wagons long. In Australia, here on the east, eastern seaboard, we probably uh, carry around only 75 tonnes versus the 100 and our trains are only 40 wagons long compared with 100. So what are we doing about it? Well, we're trying to um, definitely play a role, our role, to improve performance. We've invested to improve productivity from our trains over the last four or five years by around about 40%. And we've committed many millions of dollars in additional capex to target a further 60% improvement to our rail productivity. We also invest $50 million a year in rail capacity uh, in the form of, of, of long-term take or pay arrangements with the rail operators where we take the entire risk if there's a crop failure and, and not enough grain to transport. We've taken on this risk to give growers and our customers as much certainty as we can, but getting grain on rail to port requires more investment from other private sector industry players. The reality is that this investment is unlikely to be forthcoming though, while governments allow the uncertainty surrounding <coughs> the future of branch lines to continue because there's not much point in investing in trains if you don't have rail to run them on. Use of, uh, of, of rail is also constrained by capacity. Unfortunately, grain and other agricultural commodities are, can be a bit of a low priority when compared with coal and other minerals. And we compete for access on some of the most congested routes to port. So notably down the Toowoomba Range to our Brisbane port and through the Hunter Valley to our Newcastle port. In both of these regions, we're seeing more grain arrive at our port on the back of trucks because the rail capacity is just not there. It's been good to see some recent positive developments from the state governments. However, if we are to have enough capacity to transport larger crops as the demand grows, the agricultural sector is going to require greater certainty on the future of regional branch lines and a move away from the current ad hoc approach to funding. Let me turn now to foreign investment. Ensuring Australia has an internationally competitive supply chain is an expensive business. ANZ's excellent Greener Pastures Insight paper, published last October, values the revenue opportunity for Australia from the dining boom at something like $1.7 trillion to 2050. That same paper identifies that capturing the boom 
will require up to a trillion dollars of capital to be invested. That's about three quarters of our current GDP. Agriculture is an extremely capital intensive business and you know, it's very unlikely that that investment is going to be able to come from Australia. So as a nation we need to do everything that we can to assure, ensure our country remains as attractive as possible to capital from all sources, including from overseas. There's nothing new about foreign investment in Australian agriculture. We've always had to rely on inflows of foreign capital to support the growth of our industry. Yet if you listen to the public debate, you'd think we were facing some sort of new threat or development. Australians are being presented with two starkly different alternatives in this debate. We can actively encourage capital to be invested in our industry to help us meet this one trillion target, or we can throw up barriers and make it difficult and unattractive for foreign capital to be invested here. Under the second scenario, Australia's, Australians will just have to accept that growth in our agricultural sector will not be able to keep up with the growth in demand and that our country will become increasingly marginalised as the global food boom escalates. Agriculture just can't be managed as a domestic industry. We export the vast majority of what we produce. We're competing in a global marketplace against large competitors. We're trying to sell products that are the difference between life or death for developing country governments and their people. The regulatory framework that guides agribusiness policy needs to recognise this and be very outward looking. Yet often the debate on agriculture policy and issues is caught up in domestic issues and rivalries. It's, it's very inward focused. And this applies to foreign investment and also sometimes the regulation of large agribusinesses like Graincorp. I think the challenge to all our political leaders and participants in this debate is to shift their view from their immediate surroundings and near-term horizons and look at the enormous benefits that will accrue to their communities with a bigger picture approach that might be tougher to sell but will deliver a far more compelling legacy for our country. In conclusion, notwithstanding the challenges and debates I've just outlined, there are three things that give me a lot of confidence in the future of Australian agriculture and soft commodities. Firstly, our industry has a proven history of innovation. It's dynamic and constantly changing, and I think this will always be the case. Secondly, we've got a proven track record of overcoming conditions, particularly climatic extremes, that would be deemed way too challenging in other parts of the world. And finally, for the past 200 years, Australian agriculture has been built with a focus on exports and global demand. And this is where the benefits will be gained for us over the next four decades and beyond. Thank you very much.